Thank you so much. It was a very sweet introduction. I appreciate that. So let me just say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, in Los Angeles um, thinking about these issues. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, the religious right would probably say that that you know ground zero for the failure of marriage is right here in Los Angeles, let alone perhaps in the Valley itself. So I want to um, thank you for the opportunity to explore these challenges. And I, I want to just a couple of introductions to the problem before we dive in. Um, I just want to begin with a certain sen sense of humility in the face of a topic that, uh, that I, I, I truly do not want to claim expertise in. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, I finally partnered in my 40s. I'm in the midst of a commitment, uh, a, a, a relationship that actually was uh, affirmed by the state of New York as a uh, civil marriage um, uh, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, I have a three and a half year old daughter um, by extraordinary means brought into the world. And, um, and, <clears throat> and I want to just say that uh, anybody who says they've got marriage down, I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to just begin by, by affirming something that is sometimes counterintuitive um, and doing so um, with, two sto with a story and a text. But I kind of actually want to encourage um, a certain kind of, and, and it fits the, the Hartman model, a certain kind of modest curiosity rather than rabbinic mastery on the kinds of questions that face human beings today that we are um, g barely guides, but we are partners in. We are, we are, we're walking partners in the sense that you know, we can accompany people through the challenges of making sense of things. And I want to, so that, that just to begin with a certain sense of astonishment and openness at not knowing, it is probably the, just the clearest invitation to wisdom is, not, is admitting what you don't know and the curiosity. As I, as I tell Orthodox rabbis all the time, he says, my constant, I'll, I'll tell you one other story is that I, I can't even mention the name because uh, when I mentioned this story the, the next week, he called me up and asked me never to repeat it. But a head, a leader of the Orthodox community, once said to a Wexner group, when asked about homosexuality, the answer is, I don't know. I used to tell you, I have Pasuk in the Torah, I've got, I knew the answers. And then I met human beings, and then it's all confused to me. I don't know enough about the topic of homosexuality, I don't know enough about how the Torah can engage it. The best I can tell you is, do your best with the 612 means vote that I know more about. Join my shul, and God is merciful, and you'll be all right. Like, I said, I, I, said, I love that. I, I said, I, so, and I quoted him, and he called me up literally the moment I, I, you know, like, stepped down from the podium and went home into the hotel where I was speaking. Please never call me again. So, the, in other words, well, I, in the end, I don't give him his name. I just say the story. But the, but the point is, is that I don't know seems to be, an abdic to some people, an abdication. And I just want to affirm that I don't know is, a is, is an honest beginning in many circumstances. So it's extremely, I mean, I'm sure you do this all, all, already, but in particularly these issues. And then the second thing I'm going to say is, is that whatever positions we've formulated, mine included, I think it's extremely important to be, um, uh, and this is also related to the Hartman methodology, um, curious about the opposition in deep ways. Because my commitment to pluralism goes like this. You know, when I joined Klal, um, so Yitz said, I said to Yitz, is Reform Judaism a legitimate Reform Judaism? He said, yes. And I said, I can't work for you. I said, I just graduated by you. I mean, I just can't, I can't work for you. So two years later, after I had a pulpit, I realized that I was desperate to get out of the job. And so I, he said to me, well, can, can you be, I'll hire you if you can be pragmatically pluralist. And I said, what's that? He said, they're wrong, and you're going to be nice about it. And I said, if I can live with that, and you can live with that, I'll join. Two years later, he had convinced me of what's called pragmatic pluralism. 
Pragmatic pluralism actually drinks from that humility, that original humility that I mentioned, is that since we're all human beings and no one knows the truth, then being, being open to the opponent, because he may have or she may have a piece of the truth you don't have, is really crucial. That's A. But B, that we all choose denominations and partners and, and political you know, uh, parties, not because they're perfect, but because the excellences we cherish the most and the weaknesses we can live with. And we all choose that way. We choose the partner whose excellences are most precious to us and whose weaknesses we can live with. If you can't live with those weaknesses, you better not choose the partner. And if the excellences don't fire you up, you're probably not choosing the right one either. And no one chooses all excellences and gets away with no weaknesses. So once you get that position, you're just always open. It just creates a very different sense. And therefore, the people who've made different choices about what's excellent and what's weak, I, I have no contention. I, in other words, I also am making choices in, this, in a similar vein, and we can begin to communicate with each other without this kind of, you know, absolute truth or clarity about why we're right. So, um, last story. Um, I think it's extremely important in this frame, particularly because of my entrance into this around LGBT um, life-making and ultimately marriage. Um, is uh, to recognize uh, that um, it's extremely important for uh, radicals to be um, resilient rather than to demand safety. So I'm not in favor of the gay creed de coeur all the time of this is an unsafe environment. While, by the way, I fight for that. But I'm very nervous about that frame for all kinds of reasons, because the life isn't safe. And therefore, I prefer to give people resilience rather than to make them give them the illusion that they're going to go into the world and not encounter, not encounter difficulties. People who don't. So I was I had just come out of the closet um, in my uh, uh, in the papers, and uh, I was walking the street in New York City in front of a synagogue, and. Um, and uh, the synagogue's leaving, and I'm going to someone's house, and someone noticed me, hello, oh, how are you doing? And then a friend says, oh, starts screaming at me, you're the public homosexual, you're the chayt the yumachti, you're the person, you're the disgusting piece of garbage who, who is perverse and sick, go back to the bars and clubs where you belong. And, and of course, this is happening as a crowd is forming, as the people come out of Olaf Zedek, which is mating central for Orthodox 20-somethings, you know, in New York City. And... I, I, I tell you this story because um, it's extremely important that often we, we learn how to respond to human challenges by experimenting and winning or losing that gamble all the time. That's how we learn as rabbis. We learn by trying something and it either we fall on our face or all of a sudden something happens and we go, wow, I just learned something about my voice. So I, I remembered at that moment that my uh, something my judo teacher or karate teacher in YU taught me, and that is that when when a punch is coming your way, do not be at the point of impact. Don't be there. And I saw all these words just float right beside me, and not into me. And I began to realize that he was seeing a figment of an imag. He, he had an imagine imagination of a person, a monstrous person, that wasn't there. And I didn't need to be angry or hurt or frightened, or defensive. I needed to help him see better. And it was true, I have to say this real honestly, it was truly my, the, my shedding of any hurt or aggression in response that allowed me to speak at all in any constructive way. And I said to him, I'm sorry to say I will probably be your worst nightmare. Because I, you know, I don't go to the bars and clubs that much. I do go to shul. In fact, I exaggerate. I have a hundred gay Orthodox friends. We will find partners and find a way to make families. We're going to push our baby carriages into your shul and we will not leave. And he freaked out and walked away. <laughs> and, and what I learned was, was that the key to this process is one of a certain patience with how hard it is for people to grasp change and difference. 
And I just say, the, there's a certain generosity we owe people who are having a hard time. And to not respond with epithets of, of, of prejudice. And it's just, we need to help people overcome misunderstanding and fear. And that takes patience and time rather than hurt and, and, uh, and, anger. and anger. Got it. So with that introduction, it gives you a sense of my model, which is the book I'm most curious about when I was, did this study. And I want to say, I'm just beginning this work, meaning I've thought a lot about marriage. And I've taught a lot about it, but now I'm actually thinking it needs, um, I'm going to say this in a, in a kind of uh, um, direct way, that there are very few topics your people are as concerned about and as unenlightened about, both in terms of their own lives and in terms of institutional realities and historical realities. So that the opportunity for you to help navigate a deeply contentious and challenging question about the conflict between the personal and the communal, the tribal and the emotional, the, you know, the pragmatic and the principled. Like, this is an extremely fertile opportunity for you to say the Jewish tradition without navigating, without claiming um, perfect, a perfect model has, has frames of engagement that are very rich. And that, so that I'm just basically inviting you to imagine, uh, I think that the reason that I wanted to do this program is that I think you all, I will, uh, we can give you a reading list. You ought to go home and read, you know, a handful of books on marriage conflict today and come up with your own year-long or six-month-long curriculum that you teach. And the reason I say this is because your people are incredibly hungry to understand themselves and what's going on in the world around these issues. And few people are helping them navigate and what a wonderful opportunity for you to be helping them navigate. The book that is was most interesting for me to read is a little one, Man and Woman, A Defense by Sheriff Gerges and Anderson and George. And this book is the Catholic defense of what they call conjugal marriage over and against the um, what he calls the revisionist version. And that revisionist version would, would be open to same-sex marriage. The conjugal definition of marriage would not be. It defines marriage as between one man and one woman focused specifically on the reproductivity of their bodies as key to the very nature of marriage without which it undermines its destiny and ultimately undermines the institutional strengths by which it actually serves humanity broadly. And it's a very interesting argument, spurious in a bunch of ways that you can decide on your own or not. But, but the, I guess what I'm just suggesting is, is that the most interesting text is the one you don't agree with. So I just like, don't, don't hesitate. Um, I'm sure, you know, maybe you don't already, but I was like, it's that, that's where actually the most interesting um, fruitfulness in engagement comes is that well what is the best argument that is how I wrote my book about you know wrestling with God and men about homosexuality is that I was seeking the best argument What's for the title it's called what is marriage yeah the other the other book that I'm going to encourage you to read is marriage a history by Stephanie Kuntz she is right now the, the probably the single most authoritative voice on what marriage the history of marriage, which actually is a fascinating romp and could provide you with sufficient material for a year um, in regard to kind of like the richness of the transformations of marriage. And I'm going to introduce that in a second. I want to do one text that um, I'm just going to, can I get another cup of coffee with milk? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The first book, this one? Yes. Um, you're gonna, you'll find it. It's G-I-R-G-I-S, Gurgis. Gurgis. Um, so part of what um, developed very slowly in the, um, in the late Middle Ages, very slowly, 
profoundly in 1790, and again in 1890, and then finally in 1920, and then finally, after a lull in 1950 where we thought we'd figured it out, exploded again in 1970, was the conflict between the personal needs that people get fulfilled in marriage and the structural frame, thank you, it's all right, the structural frame by which marriage was shaped historically for thousands of years. No, almost no society um, until, you know, 400 years ago could have conceived of love being important to marriage. Love was a lovely potential consequent, but never a sufficient cause. Never. In fact, a threatening sufficient cause because all the needs of communal survivability, of, of, ec of economic survivability, of power, of wealth making, of safety, of the whole business of the social effectiveness of marriage was threatened by the fact that your kid fell in love with someone not appropriate. And therefore, love was a threat to the continuity of the community and the tribe, and therefore sidelined as a social interest. Everyone thought it was lucky if the person that you ought to marry was the one you ended up loving. No one, there was no rejection of love as a happy potential, but it was fickle fate that made that possible or not, and irrelevant ultimately to the success of marriage. So that totally, like just getting your people to get that marriage as an institution only very recently was about the love of two people, fundamentally, is explosive re is an explosive reality that they that will actually help them because part of what we're str struggling with and part of the argument in this book is, is that if all the resources of marriage get framed upon the emotional um, uh, uh, intensity of the love of two people, it makes marriage insecure and vulnerable and fickle and threatened, ultimately endangered to its core. Because, as we know, emotions are not as easily dependable as arrangements, right? And therefore, it's interesting for people to begin to digest the notion that love potentially is a threat to marriage rather than a resource for it. Now, that said, no one will argue with the transformation that has turned marriage into a personally unfulfilling but necessary reality for many people to a potentially fulfilling reality to many people, but it has also made marriage, in the minds of this author, misunderstood and ultimately threatened as a successful institution for the furtherance of the human condition. So um, I'm going to... So prior to that, would you say the primary cause then was, was it property? Was it, you know... I'll tell you. Work for you? What was the... All that. Um, uh, here's the thing. Prior to the modern period where there was a social... Um, you know, a social net of some kind, a safety net of some kind. Prior to insurance, prior to a female's being able to earn a living safely and effectively, prior to um, a, a, new, a new notion in which uh, the children and elderly were not um, uh, a deep threat to the independence of young people. Um, marriage was... Uh, the only it was it was it was what made um, uh, corporate life possible. It, it replaced. Put it this way: You're a family living in Venice. You have a certain amount of wealth, but you know there are families in Genoa and in Rome that would extend your capacity to sell the products that you're making. Marrying off your daughters to those families was the way that you assured that the business relations would be amicable. So you married off your daughters and your sons from time to time as they were resources. Children were, were formal resources, not only in the lower 
in the, in the working class and, and poor families for hands on the farm, but they were resources for extending your effectiveness, your wealth, your markets, right? They made sure that amicable relationships, not only between families and nobles, right? For Jews, for sure, families, right? The international Jewish network of trust and banking, shaped by family alliances, sealed by marriage. So marriage was one of the most significant tools for ensuring that you're not going to basically screw me over in a business deal. How do I know that? Because, yeah, your son is married to my daughter. You wouldn't want to do that. And it's how nations were built. It's how, it's how kings consolidated power, right? Um, it's how wars were fought or avoided, right? We're going to see all this in the, kind of, in the biblical materials. But for people to get that marriage served a broad array of social functions that are no longer necessary for it, and therefore our, all our struggles with marriage are that we've replaced its function and with other things, like it, it serves other purposes. Those other purposes are much more fickle. And so to think about two things, one is, to have a corporate or tribal eye on the personal and to have a personal eye on the tribal is where the insight actually can come. Because the modern frame that if you love two, if two people love each other, they should have a, a marriage or a wedding is ultimately weak. I, when people come to me and say, and you're gonna see this in the material. If people come to me and say, we're in love, we wanna get married. I say, love is really not a sufficient reason to get married. Mm -hmm. And they look at me and say, well, what do you mean? Yeah. Do you really want to do our wedding or not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I say to them, I hope you love each other intensely for the rest of your lives. But the responsibilities you engender, the consequences and realities you give birth to, will be so much bigger than what you're feeling now, I cannot begin to describe it. And so therefore, I want you to understand fully what you're doing. It's certainly motivated by love, but it's so much bigger than that. And so here's what I say to young people. By the way, it's how I constructed the ceremonies that you're gonna see. So when I say to young couples, I say, you know, two people fall in love, that's great. Throw a party, don't get married. <laughs> so if you wanna get married, here's what you're doing. You are offering your committed love as a resource for God to do bigger things. You are offering your committed love to the community as a resource to do bigger things. You are giving your love as a gift to the larger communal enterprises. And you must understand that is what makes it a sacred moment. Now that is a, that, that by the way, when you have a bride walking down the aisle, and I tell brides to do this all the time, walk down the aisle, have a tehillim, or at least one tehillah in your hands, like or, or memorize it, and pray for the well-being of people in your life who are hurting. Because God cannot resist the prayers of a bride on her wedding day. And I get them to flip the moment, because what I want them to understand is, this actually isn't only about you. This is about your, your joining a particular kind of like, a shaping of a fantasy of a community that is responsible. And so it, for that very reason, I, in other words, it just becomes, first of all, I think it shapes a much richer conversation because then you can say to them, and that's why I want to talk to you about kids and education, and that's why I want to talk to you about the kind of home you're going to build. And that's why, because we love each other, everyone to get married leads you to, and it's very lovely, I hope you're, you get good counseling because <laughs> that'll be hard to sustain quite in that way for a very long time uh, but other things you're going to do are going to come in and like open your experience in ways you have imagined before so I, I think that's really our role here our role is to allow the personal to become um, enmeshed in the tribal in ways it didn't it, it wasn't open to and the other way around, um, uh, which is why you know I want I, I'd like there to be same-sex marriage oppor opportunities for people. Um, 
I, uh, we, we have, there's, a, by the way, so I want you to, I'm being very honest here, is that I'm in the midst of creating this curricular frame around marriage. So I, I started by giving you texts, all, all these biblical texts, that demonstrated the variability of what marriage means. And we're going to do some of them. But I wanted to, I to lift our attention not only from those materials, and we're going to focus on them in a bit, but I want to kind of open the conversation to what you think your role is as a rabbi in this job. And we're going to spend the, best, the next part of like the 45 minutes to kind of explore through these texts what you think your role is, what, what are the conversations that you already do have, and what conversations do you think you could have ongoingly. Um, in two ways. One is, in the moment when you're asked to do a wedding and are doing and have agreed to and are doing the counseling for it. And secondly, in your, and I say this because I know that it's been done actually here, because I remember people telling me that there was once in this shul a marriage enrichment program. Years ago. And, huh? So here's the thing, is that I think there's actually a new need for inviting couples into a religiously framed marriage enrichment opportunity at year 10 or year 20 or year 30 or however you want to shape it. And that I want to, I want to spark your interest in thinking about who you'd partner with to do that and how you would do it. I think couples need it. Um, and um, I know that I want to try to make this happen with gay couples because their needs are, are are, are similar and not identical, and there's no frame for actually supporting the ongoing vi you know, vitality of marriage for same-sex couples. Certainly, straight couples need it as well. And so I want to encourage you to imagine that three things, this is important for your, for your um, engagement with the couple when they're starting. It's important for, um, uh, you know, for your structure of the ceremony. It's important for teaching a course in it in your shul, and it could be important for actually shaping, let's say, a marriage enrichment weekend that your synagogue could actually put on and invite anybody from any community to join. So with all that, with that said, um, I, wanna, I wanna turn to um, a text that I love as a beginning frame. So I passed it out to you. Um, I didn't think of it except on the plane. I happened to have it with me. Um, Daniel the tailor is sitting, is sitting in the back row in Pumpadita, and the rabbis are studying Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. And the pasuk they are studying is Heshavti ani ve'eret kol ha'ashukim. I returned and I saw all the oppressed. Asher na'asim tachat Hashemesh that happen under the sun, and behold, here are the tears of the oppressed. And they have no comforter. And their, their oppressors have power. They neither have power nor do they have comforters. And a tailor in the back of the room explains who are these oppressed. He says they're the mamzerim. Behold the tears of the oppressed. Their father sins. What does that have to do with these insulted ones? The father of this one went to a woman forbidden to him. How did this child sin? And how does it concern him? So his first beginning is, is that there are laws on the books designed to discourage couples from fooling around during marriage because a child born in an adulterous affair would end up not only being threatened in terms of maybe patrimony, an inheritance, all that stuff, but fundamentally not able to marry into the Jewish people. Like really, literally deprived marriage. And the rabbis tried to get around it because they were uncomfortable with it, so you could marry another mom's there, whatever, but basically excluded from marriage. And there's no one to comfort him, but in the hands of the oppressors there is power, and who are the oppressors? The hands of the great Sanhedrin of court of Israel, which moves against them with the authority of the Torah, and removes them from the community of Israel. Saying, you know, Mamzer lo yavo bakal, bakal Hashem. The Mamzer can't enter into the congregation of the Lord, which was specifically understood to mean marriage. And there was, since there's no one to comfort them, Daniel the Taylor puts words in God's mouth, it's upon me to comfort them. 
Um, what does it mean that the rabbis are oppressors and it's, a con, it's upon God to comfort them? So I'm just wondering, uh, understanding, like, what are the rabbis saying? Like, it's clear that, Rab, that Daniel the Taylor is offering a profound critique of the rabbinic enterprise. What's exciting about this is that the rabbis do not need to listen to tailors. They don't need to codify what a tailor said. He's not Rava or Abaye or, you know, that's right. And they are recording what essentially is an unfairness emerging out of the corporate interest of marriage that causes personal uh, pain unfairly. And did you say this is the Sanhedrin? Are we talking about the chief rabbi of 2014? And... <laughs> <laughs> no, so now you get, look, that's why I love this text, because, because two things are interesting to me. One is, God can't stop the rabbis because he's given them, I mean, the project is ongoing, and they have, on some level, formally every right to turn the law into praxis, and yet they are oppressors. And God is in the role of, of the best God can do, Nebuch, is comfort the suffering mamzer. And ultimately, the implication is, take a look at what it says in the end, in this world, there are unworthy ones among them. But in regard to the times of the Mashiach, Zechariah already prophesies, this is a very creative read of Zechariah, where it says, um, I saw that, that they are all pure gold, meaning somehow he's associating Zechariah's vision of this gold menorah as Klal Yisrael with no like even the mamzerim are pure gold. And therefore, in the end of days, they'll all be purified. Right? So what I guess I want to put on the table is the frame by which um, excluding people from being able to marry for the sake of the corporate interests of marriage is not a new problem. It's an old problem. It's one the rabbis adopted as a critique of their very project and they themselves made it increasingly difficult to prosecute Mamzerut. They undermined the capacity of people to share information about the Mamzer and ultimately did their best to restrict the efficacy of the information about Mamzerut and therefore attempted to limit its impact with a vision in their heads of this Zachariah fantasy of a world without Mamze Root as a as a as a concern. Right? Now our our contemporary problem is not even about these Mamzerim, but about the technical Mamzerim shaped by Aguna and, and, and get, getting in our time. It's even far worse than this. I mean, how many Mamzerim were there in this moment? Probably very few. We have lots of them because of the for the, the formal problems of our shared you know, struggle with what it means to divorce. People who clearly are not married to each other don't have a get and therefore, like it's not, it's not the, this is a very radical thing to say for very few numbers of people. We have an Orthodox rabbinate who won't say something even half this radical and the numbers are shaped by a formal reality, not a real one, and they're, and they're probably numerous comparatively. Um, so I, I offer this as a kind of way to say the struggle between the fairness for individuals and the corporate interests of the community is not new. It's an old problem, and it continues to be a problem that we face, and one that I think it, you know we ought to um, focus some attention to. No, it's an interesting thing. I've never found them anywhere else. Well, it's a, he very well could be, but it you know you don't. I, I, I mean, I think he points to that. The tribal, he you know. could be, but it's interesting that we don't really have that many. I, I, it's an interesting question in general to find out where the does the voice of the moms actually even appear? Like you know, we don't have a voice of an androgynous person. Do we have a voice of a momser person? 
So I, we may, I, I, it's an interesting research question. Um, but what's important, of course, is, is that, what does a tailor do? He repairs. He repairs. So there's, huh? And creates and, and you know, sews. Sews things together that are ripped apart. Huh? Right? Okay. Um, so uh, I want to begin. Um, let's take a look at the materials in front of you. And what I want to do is start with the, um, is, is the open question of what is marriage and, and open it up to the, the particular goods that marriage offers to people, um, both in terms of the tribal goods that it offers, um, which we're going to talk about, as well as the social, in the contemporary goods, or the social goods, or the even psychological goods that people um, desire in it or discover in it. Um, I'm going to read you from this book, which I think is, he articulates, or the authors articulate, um, a set of, of benefits from marriage that we would recognize that are personal, but that are tied to communal expectations. Because part of the difficulty of marriage is, is that the aspects of it that are the most useful for individuals are shaped by communal expectations. And without the communal expectations, it's unclear whether the personal advantages would hold. And that's the argument of the book, is that if we, if we mar the communal expectations, if we mar the, oh, you're getting divorced. Oh. If we mar the sense of guilt of getting divorced, and it ends up being a thing that can happen to people and it's actually not bad, and we get, we get encouragement. And in other words, if divorce comes at no social cost at all, what happens to marriage? That's the kind of question implicit here. And so I'm trying to navigate what is marriage with the, those two questions in mind. What does it do for me as a human being? And what does it do for us as a, as a community or as a collective? Right? So um, in a highly mobile age, Gerges says, we want continuity. Um, a lot of people marry for a sense of continuity. Um, what are the other reasons people marry? I'm, gonna talk, I'm reading this as a way of evoking, what are the reasons people marry? What is it? Family. So people want kids. Good. Financial. What does financial mean? Go ahead. What do you mean by that, financial? Harking back to what you spoke about in, in olden times, that sometimes some marriages today still are more about the corporate relationship that is created. Um, you mean each of them feel that living alone would be more economically threatening? Or is that more like women who want a larger uh, breadwinner in the picture? I mean, I, what do you, uh, yeah. Both. Some feel um, two working towards the same goal is financially more stable than one. Right. It's, um, it's one of the things that people say that ended the 1950s fantasy is that um, it was possible in 1950 for, um, actually, till, 19, till the 1970s, it was possible for a school teacher to be married, a male school teacher, to be married to a, a wife who was not working and raising kids and own their own house and live a comfortable middle class life. It's not true anymore. So that may, what you're suggesting is the reason to get married is, is that I want a comfortable life an upper middle class life, I need two incomes, not one. Yeah. Do you said something? Else? Oh, I just want to add, as well as I've met people, um, Latino immigrant men who worked on the Ford auto line in, on Van Nuys in the 60s and could afford a house. Ah, right. Right. Uh, right. So, of course, it, here's the thing, of course, so this is that this is that, in a way, the deep, the deep learning that goes through each of these things is that the, 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 the other factors that redefine marriage are not about marriage itself at all, but they are often about the economic circumstance, right? The other, the other social conventions that emerge. And we're gonna see these pieces. In other words, that 
the illusion that this book holds is that there is such a thing as marriage, independent of the social context, and that what actually is the deeper learning is, is that marriage is an institution designed to accomplish a particular set of aims and accomplishes a specific array of them in relation to the real social realities, economic or political realities of the moment. And that therefore, marriage in one moment and marriage in another, are, or in one place or in another, are actually very different animals. And so actually to think of it, you know, it's, by the way, you know this all along, is that when people say, but what does Judaism say? <laughs> and you go, oh, which Judaism are you talking about? And your people get glassy-eyed. I mean, the Judaism, you go, there's no such thing. Right? It's, like, it's the same thing, is that we are, we're actually always attempting to shape a there that where it, it's ho- totally variable because the human experience so shifts so much. So, um, so financial, kids, People have the desire for rep- reproductive potential. Um, and, and they want, often, people want to have children. Increasingly, more and more marriages, are just, people are deciding not to have kids for all kinds of other reasons. But what else are motives for people to get married? I think family and societal expectations. That it's the normal thing to do to be married. So when you say normal... Okay, well... well I would say that's a reason to get married. In other words... In other words, to belong to the bigger familial, a very tribal rationale. And by the way, not only is it belonging to the family in that way and feeling kind of like, it's almost like growing up. In other words, until you get married and have kids, you're actually not considered a full adult. There are, there are two men in the shul that when I was living in New York City with my partner, we were a block away from a shtibel that, uh, where two gay men who were Hasidim lived uh, for 40 years together, whatever, they, they were partners. And they didn't have talis on. One had a bekasha and the other was a black hat and he was a Talmud you know, genius. And they sat catty corner to each other in the shul. And they were in their 60s and they were called the Bachrim. By the shul, the shul called them the Bachrim. Because when you do not marry, you are not an adult. And so on some level, you are given the cultural expectation that if you don't marry, you're actually not a full adult. Right? Which plagues singles. When you have kids, you leave the kids' table. And family gatherings. Doesn't matter if you're 42. There's something about that. that there's something about... about um, and it's also what happens to your social world when you have kids. Transforms. When you get married, it doesn't transform that much. It transforms a little bit. It does. We'll talk about the, you know, how it transformed in, in, in other moments of history. It was quite a transformative moment for many couples. But kids are, are profoundly transforming because your whole social world now, right? right? Okay, so it's that belonging to that family narrative. So I'm going to put that down. People want to belong to family narrative. There are other people, by the way, for, you know, for good reasons, say, I do not want to belong. What other reasons do people give for marriage? Tired of dating. So I, I want... want... Lonely and wanting stability. So, so stability, and that means, in, what you mean by that is, um, and I want to just, like, let's be very clear, regular sex, Absolutely. right? So I don't have to go, like, you know, What's prowling, that? prowling, <laughs> For the next the next opportunity, I go home and she's there or he's there or whatever, right? Oh, I have no idea, but it's basically more often than not. In other words, that's all. If if, if you look in the Gemara, regular sex depending on what you do. If you're if you're a you know a day worker, it could be every day, and if you're a sailor, once every six months, and if you're a rabbi, once every week, you know. I mean. <laughs> No, um, you know, but but so so. In other words, the pressure of of the desire for sexual satisfaction ends up becoming uh, uh, kind of solved in a way. I have a, my my my. I have a little cousin who lives in L.A. 
who's had a tough time getting his act together. I shouldn't say this publicly, so I won't tell you his name. But he, he, finally he's married, and he says, the thing about being married in his 30s is that it's this incredible thing to come home and she's there. Like someone's there for me. I guess that's the piece of that, right? Someone's there. Yes. Um, they, they each get match made, they each bring a friend, yes. um, and the friends end up getting together. Uh, there's a wonderful scene where the two friends who are now married are lying in bed and they're each on the phone to Harry and Sally respectively who are agonizing about something or other. They hang up their phone, they roll towards each other and one of them says to the other, tell me I never have to go out there again. Right. And it's, it's exactly right. that. Um, so there's a, there's a, I, I think it's a, part of the, of course, um, it used to be, it was, and I want to say it's, it's really actually a hundred years. It's a hundred years since women were full persons, and it's a hundred years since families didn't have the right in most places in the West to decide who your marriage partner was. It's a hundred years. That's it. Prior to that, Families chose. I was on a train to Manchester, and I'm sitting next to this Haredi guy with a beard. We start talking, and he's going back from England, where he met with the, with the prospective, you know, uh, Schwiger and, uh, you know, the, the in-laws, talking about whether their kids are going to get married. He says, I have 11 children, and uh, this is the last one I'm marrying on. <laughs> but part of the part of the part of the challenge is is that when it's me that has to choose, the pressure on that is huge, and I go out a judging and being judged all the time. And the pressure of going out to be judged and judging all the time is incredibly debilitating and challenging. I just forget it. I just want to like end the madness and get married, right? Like, okay, okay. Um, Here's what he says as well. We want witnesses to our lives. What a really lovely thing to say, right? Is that marriage is a way to be witnessed. By the way, it's threatening too. You know? It's like, Yom Kippur, Hashem zocherot kol nishkachot. God remembers all the forgotten things and it could be a threat and a blessing. Um, your, your, your spouse knows you, knows your bull, and knows your excellences. And that witnessing is actually threatening and, chal- and sweet at the same time, right? Like, you know, so that's part of it. There are, there are living dynamic diaries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We know consolation and inf- we want to know consolation and informed advice because our spouses know more about us and can give us better advice. Sometimes not, but sometimes. We, spouses have the license to plumb our past, our present, and our most private ambitions. We want security at the first responder in emergencies, ready counsel in our distress, de facto company in defeat, and for every personal victory, a two-way tie. Spouses typically provide all these goods. <laughs> Besides, marriage itself is a school for virtue. A fe- as fear gives way to surrender, as exhilaration of surrender gives way to laboriousness and then to serene familiar, we mature. Stretched across another's life peaks and troughs, our ego is unraveled. We want from our spouses, we learn ever more to give. In vacations and bedside vigils, grand projects and modest self-denials, our spouses call forth in us new excellences, somehow making us feel, somehow making us feel all the while that we are, at, are most at ease and most ourselves when they are near really beautiful portrayal of the personal depth that marriage offers that isn't only about that infatuation moment called love. It's just about much more, right, than that. Now, I say this, but marriage is also about the, um, uh, about these formal frames of, of, uh, of survival, and the tribal frames that are actually quite different from these emotional frames. And so I want to dive into them as we open up the text. So please turn to your materials, and we'll start there. So 
the the first um, exploration around marriage um, and the first assumption around marriage, I think, for many people, is that you see animals mating, and we have basically assume that marriage is the human frame for doing what animals do. And that is, you know, a cross-gender pairing for lifetime. It, as it turns out, there aren't that many animals that pair for life. Some, actually not so many. Um, and um, there is probably, the, you know, 300 and some species that have same-sex um, some expression of same-sex um, partnering. But it is true that nature does this in the vast majority of circumstance. And so there's this sense of naturalness around marriage. I want to dive into those materials because I think that those materials often shape the discomfort around, around, um, around marriage in other keys. Um, so let's dive in. Someone please, let's, let's read the text that, I, that I've gathered here and just open them up, if you will. And I'm, I'm going to travel through these texts relatively quickly because I want to be able to leave a good deal of space for what we can learn by um, constructing a same-sex commitment ceremony around, you know, around what, it, what that means for the notions of marriage that we're developing. Okay. Anyone please read the English. Let's start with the English. I don't think we need to. Be, we'll go into the Hebrew when we need it. So st- source one. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Now, I'm going to come back to this text, but the reason I include it here is it will become, I think, a really interesting resource for talking about same-sex marriage. So that's why I included it. But I want to say something about the creation story itself that is it's, you know, exciting about the creation story and exciting about our, our conversation. And that is, creation is all about two. It's all about twos. When God creates, the existence of otherness is born, and therefore with it, the problems of power. God, there are no problems of power if there is only one in the world. The moment there are two, all of a sudden we are going to discover that there are tensions around how to manage power. And the problems of power, when two are living together or engaging with each other, the problems of power generate embedded hierarchical solutions that function at a cost. Right? Someone please continue. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And again, one more, yeah. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Um, this little poem generates um, a really, um, I think, deep and, and wonderful portrayal of the complementarity and the relationship between the genders that, um, in the minds of some, could pose some problems for the same gendered experience. But I think, actually, you know, um, part of what you're going to hear from me is, is that you know, I'm the gay rabbi who just loves doing straight weddings. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love doing them. Um, there uh, and I, you know, so we're going to talk about that. But I, I think that both the prog- the problematics and the exhilarate the exhilaration of the union of a man and a woman is part of this text. And God created by Yivra Elohim et Adam b'Tzalmon. God created the human Adam in His image. B'Tzalem Elohim bara Oto. It's that that is those two sentences are mere images of each other. Because you have Elohim bara Adam and Selim. And it's there in the, same, in, the, in the second couplet, right? In the second tri- triplet. B'tselem Elohim bara Oto. Right? Oto is Adam, bara is under, is, is there, Elohim is there, B'tselem is there, right? So it's the third of the triplet that redefines at least one word in that text. Zachar nekeva bara Otam. So if you're reading this poem thoughtfully, what is Zachar Nekeva in place of? No. No, Adam is understood. Otam is Adam. Man and woman. No, what's, what, if, if you're reading these in a row, three, like they're three triplet, right? And, and the third one is differing from the other two. 
What's missing? Selim. That's right. Selim Elohim. That's right. In other words, bara otam b'tselam Elohim. What's b'tselam Elohim? So in other words, it turns out that the image of God is is the masculine and feminine, feminine dyad frame. Okay, that's very interesting in and of itself, is that God is somehow Zachar Nekeva, that's there, B'Tzel Elohim. What's also interesting is, is that the rabbis are struggling with Otam and Oto, because earlier it says Oto and then it says Otam. So what do they do? You know the Midrash. Is that, what? Adam Rishon. The first creature was Dupar Tzufim Bra'o, God created him two-faced, or Adroginus Bra'o, he created him Androginus, and afterwards separated this creature, and so the story then of the creation of the human being as an androgynous that then, or as a dupart sufim, that is then separated, is actually a really interesting portrayal of the creation story. It avoids the potential that the first Adam was male and God was happy with that, and then it was just loneliness that generated the female. But that it turns out that the image of God itself was already male and female, which feels much more, you know, alive for our feminist sensibilities and for the reality of the humanness, the full humanness of women and the image of God of women too. And then it shapes this really interesting picture of the, the full human is male and female and in its having no, no boundary to cross and no tension is lonely. And what's the solution to loneliness? an operation that separates them and then brings them together. So it turns out that the union of male and female is what? is the resource by which the Tselem Elohim appears. That, In other words, when a man and a woman are in coitus, they are more like God than in any other moment, both in terms of the fullness of the divine enterprise, in terms of the creativity of the divine. They become creative as is God. Right? They become as full as the creator. Right? In other words, male-female union is like, it, it's a depiction of the Tselem Elohim. And therefore, th- that separation is a kind of, is a process by which the two halves, you know, find each other. By the way, this, is a, this appears in the symposium as a, as, a prior, as a prior metaphor that, you know, there are these roly-poly creatures, some half male, no, some uh, one side male, one side female, one male, female, 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 one male, male, and the gods don't like how happy they are, and so they cut them in half, and then they got to go sort of looking for their other <laughs> side. And the only difference of the Jewish story is, is that the, the gay, the gay roly polies are there, right? <laughs> only the, only the male, female ones. But the, but the picture is, is that, is that there's an element of the, of of divinity. And, and, and this, by the way, appears in Yigerta Kodesh. Yigerta Kodesh understands, and the Ramban reiterates it in, in a couple places, that a, a person is in the most holy state in the midst of sexual union. That's where that comes from. It's a far cry from the antibody frame generated by Paul in the, in the Gospels. Right? That sexual union is actually the, a divine accomplishment. Now, I want to say one other thing about this because I think it's just fascinating, is that if, what, by the way, what is the difference between androgynous and dupartsufim? Those are the two languages the rabbis use, duo to partsufim face, and androgynous, androgynous male, female. What's the difference? Because there are two positions, since of Rab Nachman and, uh, I forget the other, Mandamar, who um, uh, frame the original human as androgynous or dupartsufim. So dupartsufim means literally two faces. One facing one way, one facing the other. And androgynous? It's a single-faced, it's a single-faced already male-female being. So, in, so why, what's the machloket? That the human being was created two-faced, facing two directions, or one face totally whole, androgynous.